Nina, this is great to see you again. Um, Thank you. Well, one of the kind of influential things in this exhibition actually was your Homeland series, um, the way that militarism has kind of infiltrated the American kind of environment and psyche and in these ways with the symbols or children's games, like there are all these ways in which that series really shows that militarism is a part of everyday life. And well, it inspired me because it got me thinking about, well, if this is part of our everyday life, is the expenditure that we put toward that effort also something that we don't think about? And then to what end? Are we kind of distracted by these displays or do, do we take this as part of our everyday life and not kind of question what this means? So that's one of the reasons why I was really excited to discover this other project of yours and how I've been thinking about your work. Can you just maybe share for a moment um, how you see this project, Acknowledgement of Danger? How does it connect to your ongoing kind of interest in militarism, the impact of war in society? I think it was something that had been in my mind since I was first started as a photographer, because one of the first war scapes I saw was in Vietnam. I, had, I was a young journalist, and I went with a group of Vietnam vets to Vietnam in the late 80s. And one of the um, kind of the most intense moments for me was witnessing the effects of dioxin of Agent Orange poisoning on the landscape and the people of Vietnam and also on some of the veterans I was with. And it made me think of war in a very different way than I think how, as an American citizen, I've been taught to think of war, which is that war happens from one date to the next date, and then it's over, and we either win or lose. And then sometime later on, there's another war for another reason, and we either win or lose. And and that there's a kind of, um, you know, finality to it. And I realize that there is no finality to it, that it just goes on in a different form. And in the case in Vietnam, it goes on in the, in the DNA of the people, in the landscape, and also in the future generations who didn't even exist at the time of the bombing campaigns. I came back to some of these subjects after September 11th, looking at the impact of war on veterans, and then seeing around me the militarization, which I had also seen, you know, at the first Iraq war, I started seeing flags all over New York City at that time, which was, you know, just shocking, actually. And uh, how this patriotism, militarism, nationalism is embedded into the society and culture. So then I started working on a project on oil and gas extraction and fracking and environmental contamination by corporations. And it got me thinking about, well, what is the biggest corporation really in the United States? And that's the military. And I started to go back thinking about dioxin and Agent Orange and figuring out what else was out there. And so this led me down a road of rethinking what it means to photograph landscapes, to be an American landscape photographer, which comes with romanticized ideals, and is also very much a masculine enterprise, or has been in the past. And also just getting very intellectually excited about the discovery of all these locations that I had never known existed and this pattern of neglect and erasure of the origin of that contamination. When you were describing the way in which we're taught that war ends and begins and there's another war, that made me curious about how photography also contributes to that um, perception, right? The photograph mm -hmm. is made and it has its impact and or the, 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 the war was covered and it's over. Mm -hmm. And it made me curious about how in your own career, the stories that you tell, you have structured it so that the story keeps going. It's almost like you're also responding to the way in which photography has contributed to that perception by creating these very interconnected stories within your own bodies of work. You know, the history of war photography from Matthew Brady to Larry Burroughs and the contemporary manifestations of Larry Burroughs style photography it basically, you know, embeds with troops um, intense focus on the actual combatants. Um, yes, it's expanded out to, to include more um, attention on civilians, on you know, the intersection between war and forced migration and all of those issues, but still there's like the Syria civil war, the Afghan war, and you know, with, with sort of inflection points where the media gets like super hyped up and interested and puts a lot of resources in. Uh, this is usually um, 
inspired by um, a publicity seeking commander. Um, but in any case, not those that's not the kind of work I do. It is not the kind of work I've ever felt compelled to do. I feel like, you know, hundreds of photographers do this work and they do it quite well for the purposes that, you know, they've been asked to to do it for. But for me, I'm much more interested in what it does to a person's psyche, what it does to a community. How do you get beyond it? How do you even process it at all? And, you know, the concept of victory, it just feels so empty to me. Victory for who? So I think that the idea of like the temporal nature of war and these like finite boundaries and the idea of victory are very much combined. And I just completely discount from a moral standpoint that there is victory. So I guess by doing that, you have to then question the whole, you know, temporal nature and the, right. I read that you started out actually as a traditional kind of written journalist. Can you talk about that shift that to working in images? Are there, are there strategies or, or, or um, approaches to writing that you kind of bring into your photography? Or um, are there ways in which you think um, your photographs are, are doing things that, that your writing couldn't? Um, can you just talk about that transition or yeah. those two kind of aspects of, of working? Yeah, my aspirations growing up was to be a writer. Um, you know, I eventually got a camera and started playing around with that and using that as part of my writing the kind of the two were always sort of together for me um but at some point i had to get a job and i decided to get a job as a writer and um i think the process of interviewing people of doing research is all a part of my photographic work um but i also felt like there were things that i could say in photographs that i would just not be permitted to say in works yeah. and that's really what made me quit my job as a writer and go off into photography um and that either i would be edited out you know and um or i just you know there are ways that photos work that are just not literal yeah. and that's amazing to me right that's something that's i think for every photographer drives drives you it's like this kind of magical combination of the literal and the abstract and how that can communicate, you know, a feeling and an idea. Um, so, but, but for instance, but acknowledgement of danger, you need to read the words connected to it. You might be able to look at a picture and say, wow, that's interesting or that's moody or that grabs me in some way. But I definitely want people to read the words behind it um, or else they will not understand why I was there in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, can you just describe the project? So you, you traveled the country and was there like a first site that you went to? Um, and then how did the project kind of evolve? Like, you know, and, and is it done or I mean, I know we just talked about the finite nature, but um, are there more images that you, you'll add? Sure. So the project is called Acknowledgement of Danger. It, the title is from a form that one needs to sign when they visit Big Oaks Wildlife Refuge in Indiana. And so you're basically saying that uh, you acknowledge you're entering a dangerous location and there are munitions and that there's toxins and that you're not going to sue anyone as a result. And so this was a former proving ground, former army base where I don't know how many millions of bullets were fired over the course of the decades. And um, then it was shut down as many military bases were shut in the 90s. And it had to, something had to be done with it. And the Department of Defense didn't want to spend the money to clean it up. So they just cleaned up a tiny portion of it and then shifted that area to fish and wildlife. And this has come, become to be known in academic circles as bombs to birds. <laughs> it's kind of shorthand. Um, so it's, it's this, you know, strange um, kind of, ironic landscape where it's um there are parts that are super super beautiful untouched you feel like wow untouched nature but it's actually untouched because it's so toxic that humans can't build there and so that's where the title comes from the impetus was for me to kind of go back to this original pictures that i photographed in vietnam 
Um, I had also done work on burn pit exposure in veterans, so I thought there must be some landscape work I can do in the United States, and can I kind of look at environmental contaminants from weapons production and testing from 1945 on, and if I do take a look at it, what am I going to find? So, you know, the first location is the sort of, you know, the original sin, the Trinity site, 1945, New Mexico. I have been taught, like most Americans, that this was a test, right, an atomic test. But for a lot of people in New Mexico, they feel like they were bombed, like their communities were bombed. And it's a very different way of describing that. Um, event, right? Um, so uh, that place is open to the public two days out of the year. I'd been there many, many years before and found it pretty interesting. And so then I, I went back after having shot a lot of digital photography for many years, I went back to film and I uh, decided to use a four by five camera, which I hadn't used before. And, um, and I learned about the history of the Kodak company and the Department of Defense and, Dep and Department of Energy. And what happened, and this kind of informed how I looked at some of my, you know, happy mistakes on the project, but um, the test in 1945 um, ended up uh, spreading radiation way beyond New Mexico. And a hot spot was located in Indiana and um, and it was at like a, a paper mill and the hot spot was in the river and the paper mill used water in the river to make boxes that then housed some Kodak film and the film fogged and customers were angry and Kodak um, discovered that it was fogged because of this Trinity test so they made a deal with the US government, that the US government would provide them prior knowledge of atomic testing, which you know then became a huge industry in Nevada and you know. Um, so they would provide them with, with prior maps and locations of the testing and the radiation spread so that Kodak could source its product safely. So I mean, think about this for a second, how mind-blowing that really is is that the US government is telling a corporation how they can keep their film from fogging, but says nothing to the people in the communities not, and nothing to their own soldiers or scientists, right? So, um, so some of my pictures from the New Mexico Trinity site, some of the film is a little fogged, right? Uh, there's some double exposures. And so this was my kind of reference to the Kodak story. Um, so then I, I just started looking around the country, like where else can I go? Is it just all uh, contamination from the Manhattan Project? You know, were there locations all around the country that are contaminated still from the Manhattan Project? Um, but I found many other places and I started to look at it, you know, weapon systems, wars, um, trying to find a geographical spread. Um, yeah, so I spent um, about a year or so doing that, and I'm still working on it, just to, not so much in still photography, but in video, and I'm uh, making a three-channel film about this one current location on Whidbey Island off the coast of Seattle, which is an, a Navy base. Yeah, it's one of the things that I find really striking about your project is the fact that it's not just these nuclear sites, but there are many different types of sites that are similarly polluted or have similar kind of histories. Implicit in your work is, you know, the, the, your subject, but you're also always kind of dealing with these American myths, these stories that we tell ourselves about war, about historical events, about their finite nature, about victory. Um, so that's a that's a kind of fascinating undercurrent of your of your projects. Um, this kind of taking on these symbols and stories that we tell ourselves. Yeah, I think that's um, that's something that I've tried to grapple with my whole life. And I think it comes from feeling lied to and and feeling upset about that. And then also catching myself sometimes where I'm, I feel like, wow, is the this enormous propaganda system affecting me, you know? And I felt that very intensely after September 11th, living in Manhattan and, and all of sometimes feeling scared 
you know, to go in, in the subway, to looking at people differently. I thought, oh my, I, I'm becoming, you know, subsess, susceptible to this. And so uh, this has been um, a kind of personal struggle I've always felt in my life to sort of combat that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I do, my, I do my photography in a way to do that. You spoke about your, your that assignment in Vietnam. I mean, there was there's there's like a primary moment where you're exposed to this this idea that we're not being told the truth, which is something that a, that a new generation is confronting in different ways. I mean, folks much younger than you and I are or Caroline's age are are bringing up new questions about what are we being told about um, this country um, and about its past. Um, so it's interesting how you've taken it on your photography not only as a subject as a kind of implicit subject matter, but in your formal choices in constructing these, you know, very intricate narratives um, that kind of avoid the singular image as the focal point of a story or as emblematic of, of a moment. And I do like that about acknowledgement of danger, that it's a topic that is diffuse and the story is diffuse that you're telling. There isn't a, a, a place where, you know, we can kind of go to and we get the sense that this is, this is happening all over the place. I want to come back to a, your approach to, you know, everything is unseen, like the, the pollution's unseen, the history is unseen. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you deal with that? As, 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 yeah. as, I mean, I guess it's different, at least in a conflict, like there's the conflict, but yeah. how did you approach this? Like, where was the, where was the, where was the story? Where was the thing? Totally. Like, where do you stand? When when you yeah, it was panic, full on panic every time I get there. You know, I mean, some of it is okay, like for instance, in New Mexico, there's, you know, uranium everywhere. Uh, some few communities have had a little bit of cleanup. And, uh, so I would look, okay, I'm gonna to go to one of those communities. What does it look like? I realized, oh, they built these strange red houses. That means that those houses have been cleaned. They used to be contaminated houses and now they're new houses. So I'll photograph the red house, right? Like something like that. But then another person told me, you know, so many people in my community have died of cancer and we count the numbers of the cancer deaths in the little cemetery. So, you know, then I go to the cemetery late at night and kind of see what kind of moody picture I can make or something that that gives that there's like a literal connection between why I'm standing there and the story. But then you kind of, you know, hope and pray that then there's some sort of strangeness some kind of slight break in the reality that opens the viewer to thinking maybe what I'm looking at has a deeper story, right? Or there's something about it. There's something, you know, um, weirdly either creepy or I don't know what, but something unsettling, maybe unsettling. Um, and. I just try and aim for that in the colors and in the, um, you know, the time of day I photograph or the exposure I use. Um, in, in one picture, for instance, on the Passaic River, where they were producing Asian orange and then just dumped it, um, there's this old, like completely battered up bridge that looked like who knows when it was built, you know, and and it turned out to be a bridge in um, in honor of some Marine that was killed in Vietnam. So I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And then you go at night and I felt like I was looking at a scene straight out of Apocalypse Now with the weird green colors and the lights. And so then that becomes a kind of, you know, at least a picture that speaks to me, right? Whether it speaks to anyone else is always, you know, the, oh, the big question. But yeah, so, um, that's what I do. I usually start by by meeting people, seeing what their story is. And then I walk around and I'll either photograph them or I'll photograph something around there or I'll return to some site, which for whatever reason, you know, spoke to me about the bigger story. And is that, 
your response, just going back to a comment you made earlier on about landscape, is that your response to kind of conventions of landscape, the kind of familiarity and the way in which landscape can very much replicate our sense of vision and be very familiar and thus um, kind of present to us scenes that we think we know, um, you're, you're kind of defamiliarizing these spaces or kind of introducing the strange in order to um, make us aware that what we're seeing is not normal. Yeah, I mean, you know, my, when I think of landscape photography, I think of, wow, I think, one, I think of men, two, I think they're out there on some vehicle and they're standing on a ladder. <laughs> okay, because they want to get like the, the overview perspective, the looking down this, this sort of the superior eye view. And then I think, you know, they're using the best equipment and the sharpest lenses and they've got maybe assistants who can help them load the film. None of this stuff I have. Okay, and none of this stuff I would probably feel very good at. And it also seems like the pictures are perfect. And mine are not perfect, you know? And they're kind of a little messy around the edges. Uh, it's always amazing that a frame actually comes out in this four by five process for me. Um, but it's like finding the story within the landscape. The landscape is like neither here nor there in a way, right? And so, um, I don't know if that if that makes sense, but I mean my my practice is primarily journalistically driven, right? And so once I figure out, okay, this happened here, this is the story that happened, this is the history here, you know, but you can't see that. You just see something else. So how in a way can I make a picture that suggests that someone needs to look deeper, either by looking deeper by spending time looking at the picture more? or looking deeper by wanting to read the caption, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Which I think is fun. I mean, there's there's this whole school of thought that, oh, the picture isn't really successful if you have to read a caption. But I just don't agree with that. Yeah, in each of your images, you take a different approach. It's like each one is a different problem for you, which is also kind of a resistance to that aesthetic of the the mastery and the, you know, the, perf the perfect image. Like, each image is rough and each one is its own kind of world. It's, it's your vision, but each one is different. And they each have a kind of a color palette in a way, yes. you know? Yes. So like the star met pictures. So the star met, first they were researching for the Department of Defense, Department of Energy on various heavy metals. Then after the research was done, they became a full on uh, uranium production plant and they were cranking out um, depleted uranium for armor and they did this for years and they dumped some stuff and they were told to clean it up and then they didn't really clean it up and then I mean it's just a typical awful military contractor story that you see over and over finally that to shut the whole place down and uh, they declared bankruptcy and then it becomes a problem of the people of Concord and the people of Massachusetts and the EPA. So, okay, the site's closed. I can't get on. I can sneak as close as I can to it, which I did. And I can make a picture of a fence in a building. And then I start walking around this site and I'm like, oh, look, they're building this whole new perfect suburban little development, like right on the other side. I'm like, isn't this interesting? Who would have thought that you could be living in a suburb of a town like Concord and be next to a place that created, you know, killing products for the Balkan Wars, for, you know, and, and people are, like your neighbors around you have higher incidence of cancer, but it looks like this perfect suburban little development. So then how do you inject this sense of doom and kind of somewhat danger or whatever in it and so with me it's like waiting for this light that just hit the right way which spoke to me as a kind of strangeness right and maybe other people will see it as oh that's such a be beautiful light right but to me 
because of all the black in the picture and the shadows of the tree of the you know the trees and then the deep blue it feels like twin peaks creepy right well yeah it's funny because that one you are that that's where the myths come in too like so many myths and the myths of environmentalism the transcendentalism and it's like this is concord massachusetts this is isn't this the spiritual awakening isn't that what that light's about and it's like no that's not what that light is it's, yeah there's something else so there that particular picture really does play into a lot because there's a there's a way in which the location the myths of the locations themselves the environment and that's the same as when you're out in Trinity, you know, our myths about the desert and these spaces and, um, you know, that comes in. So some of these photographs, they really play into our kind of national myths around particular landscapes, environments, the desert, um, or this this landscape because of its that connections to the histories of environmentalism in America, transcendentalism. But it's like, that's not what, that's not what you're seeing. But I also like it is because of the architecture too, because the light highlights this architecture that's also about, you know, a kind of um, Americana, right? This kind of pseudo federal um, <laughs> art architecture that is supposed to, um, in some ways, also participates in that kind of erasure. Uh, well, if this kind of stately architecture is there, this must be okay. This must be a good place to live. You know, the American way of life, right? Which we've been told is why we go to war to preserve the American way of life is a certain sort of wealth and style and convenience and comfort, which is represented in this architecture. Okay, Everyone has their oversized, but not too big oversized, but for, for all intents and purposes, big house, right? Um, they're going to have their garage, they're going to have their one car, they're going to have their two car, they're going to have all the comforts of capitalist society that needs to be defended at all cost, and that's why we're told we go to war. And so, you know, in some ways, the two places are connected, right? You know, and that's like the stories I like the best. When you enter them in the beginning, I'm thinking, oh my God, how could they build this place right next to this place? And yeah, it's for 55 years of age and over, and they're probably, maybe they're doing that so that kids don't get sick. Okay, but so they built the space. Would I want to live there if I knew the history? So I'm thinking that there's some secretness about it. And then I'm thinking now when I look at it, you know, it's kind of a perfect American landscape, right? It's just in terms of the architecture and the values it projects. And, um, and then it's built next door to an arms, a weapons manufacturer, you know, an arms dealer, basically it's an arms dealer. Right. And then, and then, I mean, the kind of message there is like, that's what all of our landscape is, right? I mean, totally. we're, all, we're all living next to this, right? We're, we're all living next to arms dealers, whether we know it or not. And they're putting their stuff, their crap right. in our air, in our water, in our ground, and we're paying them for it. You know, we're paying them to abuse us, right? And we're, no one is watching over it. The regulators are facilitators. So it, it's just hearing just hearing you right now, it just it just really struck me how much this is like this compliment to homeland, or not compliment, but it it's the same kind of kind of sense of pervasiveness, um, sense of, of of just quotidian. Like there's a there's a quotidian quality. Like yeah. these aren't spectacular scenes, but it's there. It's there. It's like, I love that one on the beach and the jet flying over the people, like was like a stealth bomber or something. It's like, yeah. But but sometimes it's completely absurd. And right. then other times it's like so quotidian. It's like, but this is it, right? It's, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, this is it. And it's not a blue state, red state thing. It's everywhere. And, you know, I remember in Homeland really being very um, clear in my mind about that, you know, I had done a lot of work on uh, right-wing politics and religious right and the Bible Belt, but this was everywhere. This transcended red state, blue state. This was a unifying principle of the country where people literally have fun through militarized experiences, and that's how this massive war has been sold. I mean, it's been sold other ways too, but this is one way to make people feel like uh, 
they have something fun to do basically <laughs> you know and yeah. but it is per faces you can find it everywhere you can go to the bronx or you can go to you know dallas texas you can find it where wherever you want um and it's just it's all encompassing yeah and i just don't understand truly i do not understand why more people don't look at it and that's maybe because it they are sort of quieter pictures or or there's no you know explosive moment i don't know i really don't know so i'm very glad that you're you're looking at it <laughs> for sure well you you've said something interesting about you know that no one's been held accountable i mean do you think that do you think that's the work of photography do you think that that oh, yeah. that, that photography is encouraging that kind of accountability or is it or is our awareness enough or what what do you think how would you do you see a function for the images i mean maybe that's the wrong word no i mean uh holding power to account is a you know lifelong uh, mission right it's a lifelong process it's not like uh you catch someone you can you catch uh, an agency doing something bad and then you say, no, that's bad. You have to stop. And then they stop. And then you think that they've stopped. No, they haven't stopped. They just move on to the next thing. And so it's a constant, you know, that's what journalists are supposed to do. Um, can photographers do that? I think a lot of photographers and myself included have had aspirations that their work will help in this process to first make people aware, second, give people some resources to point to, you see that thing there, this is what we're talking about, right? And, um, or just to start looking around their own communities and thinking, how is this happening? And wow, this is struggle has been going on for 40 years, right? Um, but it's harder to do that with quieter pictures. It's, it's definitely harder to do that, you know? And I had, I think a fair amount of success when I was photographing wounded veterans because I did it at a time when people weren't seeing those pictures and they found it shocking and they were like, oh my God, I haven't seen this, like what is happening? And and so I felt like I had some success with that. But I think one, one thing that makes it hard to continue this work, this acknowledgement of danger work is that it's uh, it's hard to create some buzz around these issues right because people are like wow okay so it's it's there maybe it's harming me but maybe it isn't you know <laughs> but this thing is definitely harming me right so i think that's th that's the challenge well but i think you said something really important there when you said that the photographs give people resources i mean yeah they say that something is here yeah. And then you also, this is making me think about something that you've said over, over the course of this hour a few times. You, you said, well, I was there. Um, and there is a way in which the photographs give us resources, but we also say, well, she was there um, and she felt something to, to make this image. What do I feel? So there's also this, this way in which you're modeling a kind of responsibility, which is also useful and perhaps what you can do, right? You can model something and you can offer, offer a resource. I hope so. I think, you know, I think my best pictures make people um, reconsider things and reconsider ideas that maybe they held, maybe, you know, missed that they held. And I think some of my homeland pictures have done that, especially pictures of children, you know, um, with weapons, which are shocking to a lot of people. They're still shocking to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, when contamination is exposed and revealed, either because people start getting sick or it happens just by chance that it's exposed, a community is put into crisis. Either they need to find water source someplace else. Flint or yeah. Right whether it's Flint, I mean, you can go anywhere near a military base or a National Guard training base, you're going to find water contamination. And so it gets people riled up and motivated. And I'm thrilled by that. Honestly, I get 
very excited and inspired. And I love those people who get riled up, who try and find a way to stop it. They are totally my heroes. And I've always gravitated to that. And, um, and even though they're not many pictures of that in this particular project acknowledgement of danger there are some people that are involved you know in that struggle particularly in new mexico i love that you say that nina this is we keep continuing like we're very much aligned uh, the last photograph in the exhibition is a photograph of a by a photographer named jeff rich and it is a a man named steve his chair where he was just an everyday person who they were built, you know, they were dumping uranium on his land in Tennessee. And he just, you know, started reading and just started working. And like this chair, it's just his corner easy chair. He eventually passed away, but it's just all these papers. Like he didn't have anything. He didn't have any special assistance or he was just an everyday person who said, this is on my land. I'm going to do something about it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean. There, That's beautiful that you ended with him. Yeah, I love these people. Honestly, I look up to them. I've encountered them so much in my career and so many different stories. I have nothing but the most, you know, intense respect. And if there's anything that I feel as a photographer, if I ever feel failure, it's I feel failure to them, you know, that that if that I tried to do something and maybe it wasn't enough for them, you know, and so that's that's um that goes back into the idea can photography be used as a means of insisting on accountability and i think it can be and it doesn't always happen but it also maybe doesn't right happen at that moment but can happen later on you know yeah that's something that i've seen with the, with this topic is that you know everyday people are politicized and so on the one hand we're talking about people not paying attention but on the other hand, this topic, it makes people political. People who never thought they were political, all of a sudden they become political. Um, oh, they totally do. This is what I'm working on in Whidbey Island with the Naval Air Station there. People are saying things that I just could not believe they would say. One guy saying, I want to move to a country with no military, no guns, no weapons. You know, I mean, the, they are, they have invaded every aspect of his life. Another woman, a Sunday school teacher, a grandmother telling me that she understands the rage and the frustration people feel when they strap on a suicide belt because she is so <laughs> disgusted at what the Navy has been doing to her community. And so, um, yeah, and these people, they're, they're, you know, they're accidental activists who are who become activists out of pure necessity. It's the only way they can continue to live in their home. Right, out of this, yes, in their home, exactly. Yeah. The only way they can continue to live. Yeah. Yes. No, yes. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we do these as, as an hour just so we can get people interested and then they'll come and, and see more. But uh, Caroline, do you have any questions for Nina? You don't have to, but do you have, do you have any questions you might want to ask Nina? Sure, yeah, I do actually have a quick question. Um, it's a bit of a two-part question. So you went onto these sites having researched the background and the history, but I would guess that it would be hard to truly know what to expect until you're in the landscape photographing, especially considering how much of the toxicity is invisible. So do you find that making these images also feels like a form of research? And I guess the second question is, what site surprised you the most? Yeah, I found myself like, so for instance, in Big Oaks, I was able to get uh, a short tour through the closed zone where no people go. And, um, and I started looking, okay, what can I, what is here that can tell me that there's something wrong, something off of this landscape? Like, and that's not anything that you're gonna get from interviewing someone or research. You just start, start looking around at little things. So. I saw like a tiny piece of pink tape and I like, what is that? Oh, well, that's letting us know that at some point the mind clear, clear, um, the mind clearers have to come in and clear the minds from there. Wow. So then that becomes my visual research Then I use that pink tape and incorporate that 
in. And so, um, and that's how I kind of approach lots of locations is that once I get there, I start looking very carefully and closely as what it is I'm seeing, if there's a clue, like a clue into the history. Um, what surprised me the most, um, well, I could spend two lifetimes before I got through all the locations. I mean, I just had no idea how much was out there. And um, yeah, that was just a shock. Still is. So, so if so, if it would take two lifetimes, though, how would how are you going? How would you like what what would be the what, what's next? Like how? When, yeah. When will so you know when this next? is done? So, or maybe when will when will you know when this is when, when this it's is, over? When the chapter, or not over, but the chapter is enough of what it needs to be for you. Well, that's the thing. It's like with this work, you know, do I turn it into a book? Do I just make this film, which I'm excited about? Um, you know, I did create a kind of formula in my research process or, or a structure, which was I would look at locations that represent different wars, different weapon systems, different types of contaminants, because there is a lot of redundancy, right? And to make sure that there is a geographical spread. Um, there are some interesting things, like one super contaminated area was just given back to the Lakotas, and this is the first time that has happened. So what are they going to do with this land, right? Um, so that could be an interesting story. Um, there, are, I haven't photographed people's bodies really, except one or two people, and I would do that with the Camp Lejeune stuff. So I was thinking of that. Um, there's also, um, I'm eager to see if there is a way to actually get rid of this uranium. Like, are there things that can be used? Can you grow things, right? Like what, what gets rid of it? Or you just like dig it up, dump it and ship it to New Mexico, which is how it happens really. You ship it to New Mexico or Utah and you just continue the contamination of that place. So, um, <laughs> So something about maybe finding like what is that other side like who are those other like are there people working on this or like expanding the story in that way yeah but i would also like to go up to love canal and uh, the niagara area because that is a story that is com that is not known in the united states so this was you know the military had a big um role to play in that contamination and that was covered up and that whole Niagara area has had been an economic decline because in part because of this contamination, not just from Love Canal, but from the Manhattan Project. So can I make a correlation between economic depression and military contamination? That would be an interesting thing to try and prove. Right? I don't know, Nina, it's interesting. It's like your work is, is very novelistic. It's like, <laughs> it, it, you'll, you'll know the story at the end of this novel that you're writing across all of these photographs yeah. it's like then we'll there'll, um, there'll be something we'll really fascinating <laughs> maybe we'll get to the end who knows what <laughs> yeah thank you so much Nina. do you have any questions for me that, that you or anything that you want to add or didn't say or i mean we will send you the transcript and the video and you'll be able to you know say yes or no or add things but um anything that you can think of right now? No, I just want to thank you so much for doing this interview with me and for including my work. It's really a great honor and I'm so excited to see the exhibition. Well, I'm just really grateful that I found found you just in time. Um, even though, as I said, I've been thinking about your work and I could, I need to go to Columbia, get another degree so I could listen to you talk. Um, oh, please, uh, come on. I, this was so <laughs> wonderful to hear you talk um, about this uh, work and uh, it's really exciting.